All right, guys. Okay, and we are live with the U.S. Chess School. We got our own GM Jesse Cry uh, teaching this uh, class, and uh, of course, the series for or the the lecture series for these two months are learning from our losses. Um, so with that, let me throw it to to Jesse. Take it away. Yeah, uh, happy to be here. Very painful always to go over losses, and. Um, before I introduce this position and the context in which it was played, let me just say it's black to move. And um, maybe even before you start asking yourself what black should play, it might even be interesting to ask, like, what is he playing for? I.e., do we expect black to be better, worse? You know, maybe it's equal. If we had the ability to do polls, I would do a poll, but we have lost the ability to do polls at the moment. In any case, um, let me say that, um, I'm gonna take that arrow off. Let me just say a little bit about this game. Uh, Kakar, so this was a US championship 2010. It was a very important round. I was having a pretty good event. I was on a plus score and here I was like playing top board here. Um, against Hikaru. Back then, 2010 is a little bit different. There were like, I don't know, maybe uh, something like 14 or so participants. I can't even remember, but you know, it was a limited field, but it was still a um, an open. It was organized as a round robin. And this is like one of the first St. Louis tournaments. Um, so it should be said that Hikaru was not always the beast that he is today. And, you know, he was always very good, but it was like the difference between Hakaru at 2680 and 27 something, 2750, was actually a pretty big jump. And I had beaten him and drawn him several times before this. So it wasn't like I was that worried about it, but I did get hammered in this game. And it's a little bit to do with maybe Hakaru getting better, but also me playing some terrible moves. Now, one reason I wanted to cover this game was that recently me and Kosti are doing this book club talking about um, Boris Gelfand's new book um, called Technical Chess and um, Technical Decision Making in Chess, I guess is the formal title. And this game I thought of because it had a lot of themes that go into this book. And I'm just gonna mention some of them now. And they're just kind of like things that happen in positions like this. They might happen in all games, but definitely in positions like this, like uh, some kind of turning point, like a moment in which maybe one side is doing fine and then it all falls apart. Um, some moment where one side has to decide whether they play passively or actively. Uh, and then also the first question, which is really always an interesting one, which is just to ask yourself, well, what are you playing for, right? Like it's unclear when you just look at this, who's better and why, at least to me. Um, obviously black has problems, uh, but he also has a pawn and Let's try to enunciate the problems. Um, he's got a terrible bishop. The knight's awkward. And he has potentially, he can lose the dark squares. And of course, right now, that's the heart of the question going on right now is what are we gonna do with this bishop over here on e4? Um, another thing that Gelfen talks about that certainly applies to this game is a slide. Like you start on a, on a path and it just kind of like flows downhill and you don't even know why necessarily. And that certainly applies to this game. I suffered a slide in this position. Okay. Um, so um, I think it would have been, one of the reasons I wanted to do a poll is just to get people's intuitive sense as to who they thought was better and why here. Um, I recall playing this move, next move pretty quickly, believing 
that I was at least totally okay. And it's an interesting question, like who's better and why? Because the pawn really should give me, um, you know, give me, give me something uh, in compensation for my awfulness. But we have things like Bishop E7 going on. And let's, let's mention, in fact, that Bishop E7, maybe A5 and Queen B5. And if someone has a strong feeling about what they would like to do, we can, of course, you can just write in the chat with an exclam and I can call on you. That's for you. Um, yeah, and we'll do that throughout the course of today. If you want, if you have strong feelings about a position, I can call on you. Um, I don't think knight d5 is much of a candidate, be, but it's it's not a, it's not a, a terrible thought. The problem is the knight c5 will land with a thud. Merrick likes, or excuse me, I shouldn't call this. Somebody we've got some queen b5s and such. Okay, now one of the things I want to say about the analysis I did on this game is I did it with uh, first just without the computer. And then I did look at the computer and I want to stress, I'm gonna to try to be clear on what I thought with my human eye and then what I thought, what the computer showed me. So for example, uh, in this position, the computer in fact does not like what I played, which is queen b5. Um, to me that I, I didn't even suspect that as being a potentially wrong move um, just because it feels like I need to do it. <laughs> I need to play queen b5 and bishop d7 and get on with my life. The computer, and I think this is actually completely correct. Uh, I, and when I say that, I mean, I think you can understand the computer's reasoning from a human point of view is by playing a5, you're telling white that you can get that exchange on b4, but you're gonna pay for it by liberating my rook and fixing my pawn. Also, it's just a nice thing for black to expand the scope of the rook. And one of the things about this move that's interesting is I have a hard time uh, on a principled level playing moves like a5 because they don't i'm addicted to development um one of our friends at the chess dojo calls me a uh, tempo fiend and i certainly feel that way sometimes and this move queen b5 is indicative of that but as i said as because this wasn't really what i felt was the problem let's go ahead and look at queen b5 hikaru castled and now with my human analysis, I felt like this position was the critical, uh, the critical position for me in hindsight, in hindsight. Okay, um, let's pretend that there's only two moves, bishop d7 and castles. Yeah, let's just pretend that there's only those two moves. And while we're thinking about it, I want to stress that one of my many problems in this position is, and one of the reasons that a5 is clever, is that this business, touching my knight, is always kind of on the cards here. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to me to call on you, please put an exclam at the end. That's our, our the way we do things. Um, all right, let's get let's get a comment in here, and we. I just want to get people. I just want to hear what people's intuitions are here. So I'm going to call on Aradnia, and we can see uh, what he or she says. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so like what I said is I was just thinking to castle because like um our king is in the center and like um um 
Let's see. And also we can go bishop d7, bishop c6, like after castling. Mm hmm Okay. And is there any drawbacks to castling? Well, probably if they, like, somehow go, like, queen g4 and, like, have threats with knight f6. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Good. Thank you. So uh, let me just be clear. Castles is what I played. And um, I felt regret, remorse <laughs> in, my, in my analysis after the game about castles. And one of the funny things about this is um, about the feeling of remorse is after castles, it becomes clear that I, it feels anyway, that I'm the one struggling to maintain equality. And um, one difficulty I felt with um, castling is that my king doesn't have the ability to come to the middle of the board if we reach some kind of ending. And I, I can assure you during the game, I, pro I really wasn't thinking that we were on our way to an ending, uh, but we might be, let's put it that way. Um, so the move that I wanted to play in the post-mortem with myself, just looking at the game without the computer, was bishop d7. And one reason to be scared of bishop d7 is queen g4, but I don't think queen g4 is actually that good because you can go ahead and like check me and stuff, but it doesn't actually do anything, at least as far as I can tell. It doesn't really do anything. Um, and you're just exchanging off my terrible bishop if you play knight d7. So I was happy with bishop d7, and, and from a philosophical point of view, I, I, a principal point of view, I like bishop d7 still, um, because it feels like I can say to myself, look, I definitely want to play bishop d7, but I'm not sure I want to play castles. So let me show you then what I think white would have played. It probably would have gone like this, snip, Knight c5, bishop c6, bishop takes, pawn takes. So obviously I freed myself from my worst piece. But then there's this question of like, well, how do we evaluate this guy? And uh, it's not, it's, yeah, it's an interesting question. And this would be an one for a poll too, about how we just felt about this position. Um, I want to admit that in my own analysis, I felt this was like uh, unclear or with compensation, but it's an interesting position actually where I think I'm actually, I'm actually in some severe grief because of my lack of control on the dark squares. And I think white has more than one move to do, but even the, you know, some kind of simple queen move, for example, and then even following by like a b3, which was just going to open up everything for him and leave me really shattered in a way that I think is unpleasant. And I think that's some dark GM truths because every time I look at it with my weak GM mind, I think like maybe black has enough but I do remember getting hammered by Jan Elvis, super GM, uh, in a position kind of similar to this one where I thought like I had activity, but my structure and the dark square control was just so terrible that uh, it wasn't working out for me. So here's, I just wanna admit something that is on my um, own, Bishop B7 felt right and on my own, I also felt black should be just totally fine. Then you turn on the computer and the computer is like, ah, you know what, that's going to lead to that position. And it's actually not so good. Now, one thing I want to stress, kind of the inspiration for doing this particular game was, as I said, you know, Kosir doing this uh, technical chess book by Gelfand. And one of our questions really was like, well, what does it even mean to call something technical chess? And it's a little hard to say, but it's one of these things that you know it when you see it. 
and we're definitely looking at a technical position now. And to that end, let me give you guys the chance to play Hikaru here. There's probably more than one way to play for white here. But imagine you're white, and the question is simply, white to play, what should you do to try to make black's life uncomfortable? And remember, please put an exclam if you want to try to explain. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I definitely want to admit that Hikaru surprised me here. And um, one of the things about it that's interesting is people are saying things like H4 and they're not being jokey about it. I don't think they're being jokey about it in the sense it feels like right white should launch over there on the king side and one hilarious thing about this that i discovered after long after the the game was that you know maurice ashley was commentating this position and really felt like white had to do stuff like h4 and queen h5 and that kind of business over there um for example, we got, well, let's get Timothy in here. Timothy's got an interesting idea. We're going to talk about it a little bit. So, Timothy mentioned, I'll just put it on the board. A4 takes, takes, queen h5. Okay, Timothy, tell us why you like this. Well, like, I wanted to, like, attack. So I want to get his, but his queen, I noticed queen h5 and knight g5, but his queen was in the, was like stopping. Uh-huh. Okay. And what do you feel like, I don't know, is the evaluation of this position? Um, maybe plus like 0 0.8 or something. <laughs> That's very concrete, 0 0.8. <laughs> Um, fair enough. Yeah. Um, and I think you're on the side of Maurice Ashley who thought something similar. Um, and, you know, I guess I want to play something like that. It's a little bit hard to see how white gets an attack going. And you do I mean, at least have to worry about that. Pawn. I don't know how big of a deal it is, but you do have to worry about it. Okay, so, but yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea. We got some people saying there's no basis for attack. And um, that's an interesting question. White has to ask himself precisely the question, like what is he playing for? And so we go back and uh, here we go in this position. And like I said, I was surprised. And it's interesting, definitely interesting plan that Hikaru plays here. Um, all right, let's do one. Let me do one more. and We can get some sense of people here. Aranya. All right. And Aranya, well, um, I, go I, ahead. So I, I wanted to go A4. Mm -hmm. And lonely moves queen a5, and now I go uh, bishop b4, bishop uh, b4, a5. Mm -hmm. Definitely not a bad idea. Let's put my knight, I, I guess I could put on b7, but let's put it on b5 first. Um, okay, like now probably like queen c2. Uh -huh. Let's do this one. Um, I guess maybe knight c3 is good, but like. Well, I wanted to have an open B file and knight D5. Um, bishop D5 and then like... Oh, 
maybe like um like remember i'm up a pawn right oh, i got okay. a very very nice now my pawn is very healthy on c4 oh yeah i forgot that you're up a pawn here my position is perhaps so bad that it's easy to forget <laughs> let's go back yeah but definitely and i didn't honestly i didn't know you know what kakaru would do and i did not know how to evaluate the position um again i kind of felt like i was okay though of course i recognize that some of my pieces are a little funky um okay well let me show you what he did um i thought it was a very good choice of plans and it really does lead to at least a, a position where i have some questions to make so queen e1 i'm going to go ahead and say x -Man. because really when you think about the black position uh, i have two active pieces i've got a queen and i've got a bishop uh, on b4 and after this queen e1 i'm going to have to trade off both of them and um, so one of the things that's curious about this position is, well, first of all, you go to this ending and there's questions of, well, what, how bad do we think this is? Or is it bad at all? You know, maybe you don't, <laughs> some, you know, I get it if someone thinks it's not bad at all. Um, right. And so we're, like I said, let me just introduce this Gelfand book, which I, I, I can recommend in terms of especially uh, learning how to play positions like this. And, you know, one of the ideas that I think Greg had for putting this series together was to talk about how we learned from the, mis the you know, our, our loss. And I feel honestly, I'm still learning how to play these positions. And I feel like I make some very instructive mistakes coming up. Um, and one of them, I think, is that I didn't want to believe that I was worse yet. <laughs> I didn't want to believe that I was worse yet, when in fact, I'm definitely suffering a little bit. So for example, Black now, if he believes he's worse, right, can commit himself to a course, a variety of, let's call them courses of suffering. Right. So, for example, one course of suffering I can undergo is to play a5, uh, rook fc1, c6, snip, snip, and bishop d7. And the question then becomes how bad is it? Um, and I want to say I definitely didn't want to play this kind of position against anybody and, and not Hikaru either. But this is an example of what um, Gelfand would call, I think, uh, going into a passive defense, right? I'm admitting now that things have gone wrong and I'm choosing this passive setup where white will have some challenges in breaking me down. B4 is going to be his most natural break, but when he plays B4, he's also going to be activating my rook on A8. And if he ever plays E4, he's going to be weakening this pawn on D4. In the meantime, I guess my uh, most clear plan would be to move this rook somewhere, presumably something like here, and then bring the king in. And depending on what he does, maybe I can even get fancy and play for something like that. So um, this position is interesting because in my mind's eye, let's go back here. When deciding that, I just it just looks like, okay, I'm much worse. And also I enjoy these kinds of positions myself a lot for white, but I recognize, especially when you consider this commitment of this pawn, that's going to be very difficult for white to actually do anything. And therefore, we, what I think I would now ex expect is just that both sides are going to make numerous mistakes uh, from here on out. 
just as, as like I said, from a sort a sense of what we have to expect of both sides going forward. Um, that said, I think I like what I did even better, even though, well, it's interesting. We could see what happened here. Now, like I said, there's one of the things that uh, uh, Gelfand talks about is like the zone of one mistake. Maybe my next move is a mistake, but it's not, it's not game ending. Okay, so here we go. Bishop d7. And in general, I want to say, one of the things that's interesting about choosing passive, if I had chosen this position, is I really would need to convince myself that my position is bad. And I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't reached that stage of grief yet to say my position is bad enough that I need to commit to that a5 move and have my bishop body slammed. Because the only way the bishop's going to get active is right now to play bishop d7. Okay, well, I'll show you the position that we got. A5, knight d5, and um, I like the move that Hikaru um, played a lot here. And so it's nothing, you know, too deep, but um, yeah, if you, I'll, I'll let people give a chance to speak their mind on it. Also, just to have people just sit on it a little bit to imagine both what they think white should do and um, to what extent they feel white is now better. Aradya likes rook fc1. That's definitely a thought. And, you know, let me just say, I think a lot of players would play knight take c4 here. And well, we're going to get some kind of position like this. And now, if uh, Black wants, he can play for this squirmy position that's actually pretty hard to crack. Um, I think, yeah, this is a very instructive one, actually, because there's no more break. And as, as long as I can achieve something like here and here, uh, I'm going to be fine. That's my sense anyway. Um, and I guess he could do this, but I don't believe that he should be giving up his, uh, his business, especially as long as I can cover it and then bring my king in. Okay, so um, that would have been the easy move. And um, Maybe the move I would have made. Watch what Akaru does. Rook fc1. Bishop b5. Bishop f1. All right, let's dwell on this position for a second. And if we can, to try to figure out like what is Hikaru's plan at this point. And then, uh, after we figure out the plan, what should we do about it? This is definitely like a big moment for Black in figuring out uh, how to play the, the game. Yeah. Um, one thing that I'll say while we're waiting for people to kind of think about it too, is even now, looking back on it, I like the activity of the black pieces better in this position than the one we had just a second ago here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I just have a real problem with that bishop. And what it is, it's a, it's a beautiful illustration of what a passive defense looks like. Uh, and an active one like this one, where at least my minors are all uh, fulfilling some kind of role. Maybe e5 here. That would be kind of my first instinct. Maybe oh. e5, de, rook e8. Yeah. c5 also possible. c5 takes rook a c8. Okay. 
Um, good. Now, someone did privately tell me what I think the general plan is. And it is to take on c4 with the bishop. And again, knight takes c4, you got to believe that that is a good position for uh, white. But if you're going to play knight c4, there's no point really in playing bishop f1. And then the point is to say, oh, then I'm going to hang this threat over your head, right? So we'll recap, we'll regain the pawn and then think about things like knight e4 to c5. And um, one of the things that's interesting now about this situation is I now make make a mistake with it. I'm going to call jerking. <laughs> this is a Russian word that, um, yeah, it just basically is meant to say that I, um, you know, am unhappy with the position. And now I'm going to do something controversial to kind of, you know, get, and I'm getting jumpy with it. You know, I'm ju getting jumpy with um, my sense of discomfort here. Um, I didn't play C3. I don't think C3 would help me that much. Um, yeah. Now, interestingly, it's a, you know, I play the most violent move. And in general, I guess I have trained myself never to go passively into the dark night, <laughs> as they say. Um, and before I show you what I did, let's look at what could be called the passive defense. And that would be rook fc8. This, by the way, is um, the variation I just came up with my myself. And then the computer basically said, yeah, that's that's the position that we're going to, that, that's going to happen. And b6, when I did the analysis, I was a little unsure if I take first on c4, play b6, but one of these moves, and then like knight d3, king d6. And this is an interesting position to stare at. Simply with the question, you know, what do we think about this position? Um, right. And the thing about it, I got to say, is that when I compare just my, uh, let's call it intuitive feeling between this position and the, really the alternate one, which would have been this guy up here, Bishop D7. Intuitively, I like this one much better here because both of my minors are out and it feels like um i have i will have defensive resources simply because my king is playing and white's king isn't playing um and so from a human perspective i definitely feel like this is the quote unquote right way for black to play interestingly though the computer says no <laughs> this one it evaluates this one as being clearly worse and the other one just being a little bit worse it's kind of you know an interesting thing and, and do i do i understand that maybe kind of what you would have to feel if you you know came to that conclusion is simply that there's nothing for me to do um and at least at first glance it feels like i'm active enough that i'm doing something the real problem is it's hard for me to ever move the b6 pawn. And like as the story of the whole game, it's the story of my dark squares being funky. So even though the computer likes this um, less than the other one, I think even, even now I would rather have this thing than the other one. And a variety of things that, that white you know, white will, white actually has, yeah, just more of, well, he has question marks in the other position too about how to proceed. But this one, at least there's some chances that I might end up winning the game or something. Um, whereas in the other one with the bishop d7, I don't think I have any chances of practical counterplay. Let's call it that way. Yeah. 
But in a technical sense, I guess we have to say it's probably incorrect that I'm playing too actively and I needed to go passive with this one over here. Okay, I think some people predicted that I played c5. And that is indeed what I did. I played c5 in this position. And uh, it's about to get really interesting. <laughs> I felt, by the way, when I played c5 that maybe I was a little worse, but that I was still holding. And there were some things. Well, let's just say there were things both players didn't properly assess at this point. One of the things, too, about I was going to say about playing somebody like a Karo. Carl's a very weird guy because he doesn't actually ever seem to think, you know, he just seems to play and he doesn't really think. And then when he talks about the games, all the games, not just this one afterwards, he's just like, oh, you know, this is an obvious story. This is what happened, blah, blah, blah. And it's always more involved than that, at least in my experience. And it certainly was the case here as well. So let me show you what happened and then we're going to give some, maybe it will give a practical exercise in just a sec. So DC, Rook FC8, Knight C4, Rook C5. Okay. So that's what we got. And um, let's, yeah, let's do this as an exercise. White to play, what should he do? Now, why is the play? What should he do? And yeah, let me know if you have a thought. And while, while you guys are thinking about it, I'll just say to me now, it still feels like, yeah, I can imagine my, my just sensation then that things maybe shouldn't be that bad, you know, in this position. Um, I don't think b4 does anything. I think I can just take it on b4 if he plays b4. Um, I've got questions about me playing f6 at some point, as if that would save me. And it is going to be a very much a tempo game. And I think it's less, of, f6 would be less about stopping knight e5, more me uh, getting a a luft for my king. That's definitely going to be uh, totally critical. Okay, yeah, let's flip. We got a question, of, a request to flip the board. But let's see it from White's point of view. Yeah, and if you'd like to um, to say something, just put an exclam, and then we'll, we'll call it. It's a very concrete decision now uh, for white. Yeah, maybe knight b6 could be interesting. Rook takes right, c1, rook c1, knight takes here. b6. Okay, mm -hmm. so I said um, knight b6. Okay, and tell me what you see happening at knight b6. Well, uh, well, my idea was just to like um, get like a nice pawn on like b6 and like well, if you take it, which mm -hmm. is forced, um, and yeah, so I rook takes e one, and then a takes, and I thought like um, black's king is pretty bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, and, and we get uh, we have, our rook is on the um, going to go to like the uh, seventh rank, and like black's rook cannot do much, uh -huh. and the b seven pawn is a huge weakness, and we can go like. Bishop G2 at some point. Oh, okay, great. Probably Bishop G2 now is pretty good. Well, it's Black's move, but yeah, Bishop G2 is okay. definitely going to be on the horizon. Okay, yeah. So let me put it, one of the things that's really interesting about this position to me, definitely, first of all, an example of a technical position because when you play Knight B6, it is, it is then becoming an act of, calculation into the rook and and uh, I'm gonna say knight b6 was in fact played I think it's wrong I'm pretty sure it's wrong um, and both sides then didn't calculate enough 
stuff. Let me just say a little bit about playing the car. It's really annoying. <laughs> the guy's like playing super fast and making grimaces and stuff. And um, so he plays with an air of like, you know, the air of inevitability that you're just going to get crushed. And, you know, in fact, especially in a position like this, it is very close to, you know, being a draw no matter what White does. And that's another thing I got out of the Gelfin book as well. It's like this chess, especially these kinds of positions, it's going to always be just really close as to whether or not it's actually lost or not. Um, and so one of the interesting things about it is knight b6, the word we're going to talk about it, is very forcing. Um, but the move that um, is is less forcing is knight d6. And I think this is better. And the idea would be something like this. Rook c1, rook c1. And I think I need to close off the c file. So bishop c6. And I'm certain in the game that I saw a position like this and I said, okay, I'm like holding, right? But then if you imagine like e4 and the knight, first of all, doesn't have any great squares. Let's, I don't know where to put it. Just put on f6 for the moment. And really, there's a couple problems here. Um, the, the main one is that black is dominated. Black is really dominated. Um, 97 could have been played as well. But notice that this position is far less concrete. Like, Knight c7 was possible. Knight e7 was possible. Here we're just saying, White is just saying that he has a stable uh, bind, a stable bind on the position. Okay. Uh, let's look at what Troy said. It's kind of interesting. Um, if Knight e7, Knight b7. And this might uh, be good, but on the other hand, it also frees my pieces from the bind, right? So we imagine this kind of position. Uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's happening in this position, honestly, uh, because I can like kick the rook and something like this happens, something probably like rook b8, and then I don't, I really don't know. I don't know what's happening in this position. Black rook's fine. Black rook's very active. Yeah. Um, and that's where keeping the tension is going to be critical in a position like this. And one where if white does this, I think what he needs to do in order to play this is first realize that black definitely has his work cut out for him in a position like this. But also that knight b6 does not work. Uh, at least does not work out as well as it looks. Now, Aradnya had the same intuition that Akaro did, and Akaro played knight b6, as I remember, it's pretty quickly, but it's been, it was a while ago. Okay. All right. So, can we go over what's wrong with e4 right away instead of knight d6? Okay, let's take a look. E4 now. It's certainly a thought. Um, so this one, Black has uh, several options at least. And I am not exactly sure what's going on but i would be worried about things like rook c8 yeah rook c8 would concern me uh let's take a look though maybe you could do it i'm assuming ed you could maybe think about b3 but bishop c4 and maybe you can get tricky with like d6 bishop f1 d7 that's a pretty good trick right yeah, it's like a, I think, I think it's a good trick. 
yeah, no, that looks like a good trick. Let's try e4 again. Um, oh, I could go rook a, c8, e, d, and then just e, d, right? Yeah, that would be a problem. And then black's okay. But definitely um, a reasonable idea. Okay, so let me show you this knight b6 move. And um, I think the following variation would have been hard for both sides. Obviously, it was for both sides to see. But one of the things that I wish I could become a stronger player, and this is one of the things I'm hoping this game, looking back on it, gives me the ability to do, is once you see this position, you should say to yourself, of course, like, it's unpleasant, but it's the time to really dig deep because when we look at it, in this position, uh, there is really only one big problem. Let's call it one static problem that Black has to address, and that is the B7 weakness. Um, and in general, right, you need two weaknesses to win the game. Now, I blew it here, and so I'm going to let you guys think about this for a second. This is a great training position. What should Black do? Well, you're right. It's uh, Rook C7 is a good move, but it's it's Black's move first. It's Black's move in this position. Yeah. This one, yeah, I really. You know, for a move to 24, let me just, I would just say, this describe some psychological stuff too. Uh, for a move 24, it's only move 24, but obviously both sides have had some things, even Akaru here. And um, the. Um, and, and I now make a sloppy move that. One of these moves, I have to say, this has plagued my whole chess uh, experience is, and I guess see, a certain way everybody has to do this at some level, is to believe, say to yourself, okay, I have to do move X. And like, as in, there's no other way of playing the position. And, oh, it's just criminal. It's just criminal uh, to do it, especially if you haven't looked at it that deeply. So um, we got a couple, um, we have a couple uh, suggestions and one person actually has the right one, but I'm not gonna call them because they didn't do the magical exclamation point. And so let me show you first what I did. I fell apart like immediately. And so col the collapse just came instantly. Bishop G2 and I can say what I missed here basically. Um, and this variation does, I think, come down to one thing, and that is the variation king f8 takes rook c8. I believe that I could, you know, save myself with this, J you know, just like, just barely. But the problem is like, uh, anytime I want to, I obviously want to come up here, right? So imagine something like b4, king e7, e4, 
king d6, and then the true bummer hits with e5. And there's actually, let me just show, show this variation because it's kind of telling king e7. And let's just say f4. Now, obviously, I made white's uh, life a little easier, but let's just take a look here, here, here. And imagine f6 takes takes something like king f3. I can't I can't really get my king over there to to c8 without say rook e1 then hitting me the second I go to like king c8. So that's the conceptual problem for me that I missed. I missed the e4 e5 check business when this happened. Yeah. And I made it easier than it now needed to be. Um, but let me just say this. When I missed it, it was when I made this decision to play bishop c6. OK, we've got a magical exclamation point. It's given by Arian. Let's bring him in here. All right, Arian, what do you got to say? Well, play bishop c6 at first to stop uh, to like safeguard that weakness. Uh huh. Okay, then bishop g2. Here. This is what happened. This is what happened, Arian. It's a little difficult. Um, I ended up playing, you know, just kind of giving it away. Uh, actually, we have somebody uh, suggested e5. what? E5, okay. Bishop takes. Rook c8. c8, uh huh. And. Um... It's very passive. Oh, wait, never mind. G2 Not e5, g6, or. Okay. D6, yeah, D6, D6 to give the king a little bit of breathing room. All right, so takes. Now rook C8. Rook C8, good. Um, let's say E4. E5. Good question. And um, let's say F4. F6. No, not F6. Not Don't F6. do it. <laughs> not F6, no, that's not right. F6. I'll, I'll, I'll sack the pawn. Uh, D take C6. Okay, I guess you're going to play F6, C5. I'm, I, you know, honestly, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question. And I'll say one of the things that's challenging about the position is Black can do a variety of setups with his pawns over there. And the problem is then White can shift around to the different weaknesses and my Rook is so passive like rook a1 is always a thought. And so here white has three, let's call them three tasty moves. He's got fe, he's got king f2, he's got b4. They all have their value, right? All those moves have value. Um, I'm guessing fe is actually pretty strong though, either that or b4, one of them, you know, pretty good. Right, let's imagine king f8 takes here. Either, yeah, king f2, I guess. It's it's depressing, right? I think Wait, it's if you play b4, f6? b4, f6? Yeah. Okay, no, that's all right, you can do that. King f7? Let's try this out. King e7? No, 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 not oh, e6. King, okay, e7. E7, yeah. Back I don't know. even king e6 possible? King, king e6, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Yeah. And Yeah, the, but, okay, I'm gonna go king e7. b7. And I guess the problem is, like, the uh, rook is gonna get stretched 
So like rook here. King d3. King d7. King d6. Mm -mm. No. That's no good, right? No. Okay, but totally valid attempt. And actually in the post-mortem, that's what everybody was kind of looking at as to whether uh, Black could kind of look at it. I just totally, you know, this was like, first I'll show you the demise. I kind of gave up spiritually <laughs> like King F8 because I saw that trick with E5 and I was like, oh no. And now I really have nothing, just absolutely nothing. Someone actually recommended this Rook B8 thing here too. But it's really unfortunate. I'm just losing it all. And this is, let's call this a known, known lost position. And I gave up here. Okay, so let me conclude just by showing you the incredible resource that both players missed. And But somebody in the chat did pick this up. Bishop f1, king f1, rook d8, rook c7. It feels lost. You play g5. Okay. So stunningly, if you play king e2, I'm going to play rook d5 and rook d5. And I'm going to be okay. Surprising. Wow. So you got to do something like this. And I say check. If you go king e2, this will, the, this check, this will come with a check. So rook d1 takes. And this, look at this magical move here, g4. Now, it should be stressed that even if I didn't have the magic with g4, black has would have had great drawing chances anyway because the um, rook on a6 is so awkward, right? But now it's really completely done. And an example variation could be like rook here, rook b8, and something like rook b1, and there's going to be no way for white to make progress. It's, it's like a real, real bummer. And it's totally forced, as far as I can tell, from this position. And has everything to do with just realizing that, yeah, finding the resource. And this is a great move, G5. Like I said, I think G6 or some other move like it would also give reasonable chances of drawing. But G5, with the intention of later playing G4, really... Uh, I was, yeah, I was gonna say put in, puts a nail to the coffin in the sense that this is the coffin over here that White's king is gonna get um, surrounded in if he goes to g2. Uh, I got a question: What's the difference between g5 and king f8? Is it just the g4 push? Yes, g4 is a really nice idea to close the, the White king in, also to give my king kind of some space. Okay, guys, thank you very much. And maybe I'll just say in conclusion that, uh, yeah, me and Kosti are doing this book club. We're going to be talking about it uh, every Wednesday, except for this Wednesday because of the holiday. And I encourage you, one of, the, one of the things I always do when I teach this class is I try to teach something that I wish I had known as a kid. And it's precisely these kinds of positions that I wish I had studied when I was younger. Um, and so I encourage you to check it out. And one cool thing that we're, what I did, we're doing is, um, that, um, uh, since we're only doing it like a chapter a week, I'm spending loads more time looking at the positions than I normally would if so I was just blazing through a book. And so it's really useful as a study method, I think, to take it slower with these really hard and difficult games. Okay. So I'll wrap it up there and I'll be back in, I don't know, a month or so and we'll look at something new. All right. Till then. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, thanks to chess.com for sponsoring this class uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to be closing out the meeting here. Catch you guys all later.